Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, by way of introductions, uh, I'm Josh Evans. I'm the Director of Operations Engineering at Netflix. With me is Naresh Gopalani. He's a software engineer and architect. He'll be coming up uh, about halfway through. Um, so we're gonna talk to you today about embracing failure and about introducing failure uh, into your systems to make them more resilient. Uh, before I do that, I wanna talk a little bit about the Netflix infrastructure. As hopefully most of you know, we serve uh, video and audio to our customers so they can watch movies and TV shows. The ecosystem at a very high level of abstraction looks something like this. We have many, many devices out there in the world, customers' homes, in their hands as they're moving around with mobile devices, connecting over the internet, and really connecting to a set of clouds. Uh, the one we're gonna focus on today is what we call our AWS Netflix control plane. This is where our distributed systems live uh, that provide the majority of the customer experience other than playback and a few other elements. In addition, we have our own purpose-built CDN, also called Open Connect, um, and that, uh, that serves our video directly to our customers. Plus, we also have other partners for things like static content, uh, for serving box shots, CSS, JavaScript kinds of files, and service partners uh, like Xbox Live and PSN uh, for device authentication services and various other things like that. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, we have over 50 million members. We're in over 50 countries. Uh, every month we serve over a billion hours of uh, streaming video. We run on over a thousand different device types. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, we run in three AWS regions with three availability zones in each one of those regions. Uh, and we have hundreds of services. And at peak, uh, we run at uh, hundreds of thousands of requests per second and some services uh, somewhere upwards uh, of a million requests per second has been achieved. And our CDN has a footprint in the petabyte range and serves at terabits per second. When we talk about availability, it really comes down to these four fundamental things. Our customers can sign up or sign in. They can activate a device that isn't already activated. They can browse through a fairly rich experience to find the content that they want to watch. And then they hopefully will hit a play button and that will work well. So of course, this is what keeps us up at night. Those error dialogues that come up sometimes cannot connect to Netflix. There are various other variations on this. So this is what we are striving to prevent. So the reality is, is that failures are going to happen. You can't stop them from happening. Uh, you can try really hard, but they're just going to happen. Hardware fails, disks will fail, other kinds of hardware will fail periodically. Uh, you can encounter power outages or other types of things along those lines. Natural disasters are extremely rare, obviously, but everybody wants their service to continue running even when uh, there is a severe condition like that. Uh, software bugs obviously can affect the availability of your service, whether they are immediate when you deploy them or latent. And of course, we all make mistakes. So as we're deploying software out into our production environments or making configuration changes, uh, things go wrong. So failure is going to happen. So in response to that, we design for failure. We plan for it. And we do basic things like exception handling, uh, bread and butter kind of stuff. Uh, we design for fault tolerance and isolation. So if we have services depending on other services, we try to isolate those services from breakage. We have fallbacks and degraded experiences so that if a service that provides certain functionality is unavailable, we can provide an experience even if we can't provide the perfect experience for our customers. We also do auto scaling so that we can deal with unexpected waves of traffic or if we introduce a bug into our code that degrades performance and throughput. And we rely on redundancy uh, in various cases. Uh, good use case for that is Cassandra, which we use for the majority of our database storage. That has redundant data replication so that if we lose a node, we'll still be able to serve our customers' requests. So that's about designing for failure. The next step is testing and making sure that it actually works. Um, it's one thing to design in code, as you all know, it's another thing to see what happens uh, when you're really executing this code in anger. So we have web scale traffic uh, which makes things quite challenging. 
massive changing data sets, whether it's metadata about movies or actors, various things like that, or customer data, membership data, payment information. We have complex interactions and request patterns. We have hundreds of services. There are many, many pathways through those distributed systems. And it's unpredictable in many cases what's going to happen, or certainly for us to know every variation of what's going to happen. Things are becoming more and more asynchronous. We're experimenting with more asynchronous platforms for our code to improve throughput. And of course, all of this is happening at web scale, which then drives issues around concurrency, uh, potentially. And of course, things don't always fail completely. Sometimes they do. Uh, but more often than not, they start out failing in a partial way and then fail completely. So all of this is happening against the backdrop of constant change. We're constantly deploying new code, building new services, changing our architecture. And so even if you do know how things are going to work, even if you test and verified everything, tomorrow it could all be different. So we asked ourselves several years ago, what if we regularly inject failures into our systems? What if we break it on purpose and do this in production, which is the place where we get all of that scale? And that was the impetus behind the Simeon Army. When we're talking about the Simeon Army, we're going to talk about just a few select ones from, uh, from that group. Uh, and we're going to talk about the ones that affect the scope of an outage. So we talk a lot about internally about blast radius, the impact of an effect. And this could be a unit of isolation, could be an instance, could be a region or a zone. Uh, it is also the potential scope of an actual outage. And when we're trying to simulate those outages, it is also those boundaries or scope of a chaos exercise when we're actually intentionally trying to break things. We start with, at the beginning, with the basics. Let's start with an instance failing. And to address this, we built the first and probably the most famous member of the Simeon army, uh, which we call Chaos Monkey. And the concept behind Chaos Monkey is that you've just let a monkey loose in your data center. And he's pulling out cables, he's pulling out your boxes, he's messing with the cooling system, doing all kinds of things to damage that environment. Now, he's actually fairly well behaved because we only let him loose during business hours. Uh, we'd rather have him do things during the day when we can respond to a problem instead of having it happen at 2 o'clock in the morning. So fairly well behaved from that perspective. What we learned from Chaos Monkey was really pretty straightforward. If you have stateless systems, auto-replacement using things like ASGs works quite well. Um, your system can get killed off, a new one spins up, and it's really relatively straightforward. So there really isn't any reason for uh, somebody not to adopt this kinds of technology. Where it gets more challenging is when you have state, when you have caches, when you have databases. If you take out a node, that's a much more problematic kind of thing, and you can't just necessarily auto-replace that. And so you have to do additional engineering work to make sure that new nodes, let's say in a Cassandra cluster, come up in a good and healthy state and can bootstrap themselves and start taking traffic. We were able to do that successfully for our Cassandra clusters. We've been using Chaos Monkey against Cassandra for quite some time now. Uh, and when uh, Rebootageddon, or choose your word of choice, uh, happened, when many, many instances within AWS were being rebooted, as a result of the vulnerability in the Zen hypervisor, um, our systems were rebooted as well. Out of our 2,700 Cassandra nodes, 218 needed to be rebooted, and some of those did not reboot correctly, but we had automation in place to detect that, and they are corrected for that. We spun up new, fresh instances that were able to bootstrap, and we cruised right through that event. Um, so it was a great story for us, and I think a good story around um, why fault injection at this level works quite well. So let's move up a level to an availability zone failing, um, a much more rare event. Instances are clearly going to fail more often than a zone might fail. Or you might need to evacuate from a zone for some reason. So to address this, we created the next and slightly heftier um, member of the Simeon Army, Chaos Gorilla. And Chaos Gorilla is very much analogous to Chaos Monkey. It simulates an availability zone outage. We use a three-zone configuration. And so we essentially eliminate one zone and exit. And then we want to make sure that the other two zones can handle the traffic and that nothing breaks. The challenge is there is that doing this quickly is actually pretty, pretty challenging. Rapidly shifting traffic um, along the lines of things like 
load balancers, uh, timing out connections uh, is required. You need to change your TTLs for DNS to make sure that the devices out in the world start connecting to the right ELBs that are not going to be shut down. Uh, we had lingering connections uh, to our caches, such that we were, might be sending traffic to a node that's no longer there while we were shutting things down. And service configuration was also a bit of a challenge. Um, not all of our clusters at the time were set up for auto scaling or pinned high to handle the additional load. Uh, not all our services were configured for cross zone calls. We have some technology that allows us to try to favor the current zone unless that's not available and then route over to another zone if an instance is in an area that we're currently shutting down. So we needed to make sure that those configuration changes were made. And we have multiple layers in our technology stack, our IPC layer and also our fallback layer. We're really two different layers. If the, miss, if the timeouts are not tuned correctly, you can end up failing fast instead of routing your traffic over to another zone, which would be the desired experience so you can have a full experience for your customers. So let's move up one more level. Let's talk about regional failure. Again, an even more uh, rare scenario, but certainly one that we would all want to survive if it happened, if there was a large natural disaster that took out a particular region. So for that, we created yet another member of the Simeon Army, Chaos Kong. And before I get into that, let me just talk a little bit about what we call our active-active architecture. We're running this way in the United States today. Um, what you can see is one region uh, on the left-hand side where we use ELBs as regional load balancers. We have our own traffic shaping technology and routing technology called Zool. Uh, behind that are our three availability zones and our storage layer, uh, which replicates data between zones so that you can hit any zone and still service a customer request. Then we do that times two, and we use DNS geo routing to get the right customers to the right region. In addition, these regions actually are talking to each other because just like at the zone level, we want to make sure the customer data is always where you want to access it. We replicate that data across regions as well. And if we end up misrouting a customer to the wrong place, we can pass them back through and send them to the correct region. So a chaos exercise is really, again, fairly straightforward. We exit a region and we start migrating our traffic using DNS over to the region and have it take 100% of our US traffic. And then when we're done, we turn the geo-routing back on, and we restore things back to their previous state. So the challenges here are going to seem really familiar. Most of them I've already covered, and the same thing happens with a Kong exercise for the most part that happens with a Gorilla exercise. Auto-scaling configuration really matters. We're trying to shift traffic again very rapidly, but instead of between zones, between regions. Static configuration and pinning really matters. You have to make sure you have enough capacity for those stateful systems that maybe can't auto scale. Instant startup time matters in terms of how quickly you can spin up and auto scale for a given service. And cache fill time, if you don't have data for a particular customer, it means you're fault filling from database. Um, and that can take some time to ramp up. So you don't necessarily want to slam the other region uh, very quickly uh, and deliver a bad experience to customers. In addition, again, something very familiar, service configuration is a challenge. Timeout configurations surfaced again. Fallbacks, we discovered, sometimes fail. So you have a failure, you have what you think is a great fallback, and that fallback also fails. Um, sometimes you don't get the desired experience when you're doing those kinds of things. The most challenging thing about Kong is not, is, is not having a core set, a small set, of the most critical services that can run your overall service um, and have others that are optional. And this is something that we've been working through recently. Um, the result of that is that any service, if you are not properly isolated from it, even if you think of it as an optional thing, for, let's say ratings and recommendations, not core to playback, but a valuable service or social, any of those services can take down your entire customer experience if you're not careful. And so that was a bit of a challenge for us as well and continues to do so. So we've talked about instances and zones and regions. Let's talk about another slice of scope, and that's the service itself, a body of code that you deploy that performs a certain function within your distributed system. And the reality of services is, depending on when you deploy something and whether a bug immediately manifests itself or has some kind of latent time delay, 
you can either in affect an instance if you're doing essentially a canary and testing out that code on a single instance, or you could have fully rolled it out and then have a problem manifest, usually at peak. And it could take out either your entire service, a region, or a zone, depending on where you are in the stage of your deployment. And so defending against service failures is really sort of the next frontier and the big area that we need to focus on. Other than being functionally incorrect, there's really only two, things that serv two ways that services can fail. They either get slow or they completely fail. And to test this, we created another member of the Simeon Army called Latency Monkey. And Latency Monkey is, again, fairly simple and straightforward. The goal is to simulate a latent or failed service, inject arbitrary latency or errors, and then, again, observe for effects, and then go and correct for things that don't work the way that you expect them to. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward exercise. Um, we go and do this on the server side, change its configuration, and say, hey, when you get requests, pretend like they're twice as slow as they normally would be, or respond with errors. So challenges around this, some new things that we discovered. Startup resiliency is a challenge. Your dependencies when you're starting up your service are going to be, likely be different than the ones that you have when you're in a steady state. And so going and correcting for those and coming up with solutions is pretty important. Service owners don't always know all their dependencies, and it's hard to defend against something when you don't know that you've pulled in some kind of transitive dependency against another service. Fallbacks can fail, too, as I mentioned earlier. And sometimes you want to test second-order effects or aggregate effects, uh, which can be challenging. So instead of service A calling service B, passing through other services and indirectly accessing that service. Our dependencies are constantly in flux. As I mentioned, we're constantly deploying new code, so that, of course, introduces challenges. But the biggest challenge with Latency Monkey was actually in the design itself. It tested both function and scale at the same time. There was no staged approach to get confidence that your, func your fallbacks will function well from a functional perspective before throwing a lot of traffic uh, at that same service in that state. And so we found a lot of our engineering team said, uh, hang on a second, um, I'm not sure I want to do this. I'm not sure what's going to happen, um, so I'm going to opt out. And so we didn't get as much traction as we would have liked with Latency Monkey. And we were essentially trying to crack a walnut with a sledgehammer, um, sort of the analogy. And we really want something much more precise. And so for our next generation system, which Naresh is going to talk about, we really want two things. We want a precision instrument that allows us to test functional things separate from scale. And we want to be able to run it continuously without worrying about the effect on our production environment and our customers so that as things change, we can detect those changes. So now I'm going to hand it over to Naresh, and he'll go into that next generation technology. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, Josh. Hello, everyone. I'm Naresh Gopalani. Um, and I'm going to talk more about the service failure testing. Uh, as you had seen in Josh's slides earlier, instance failing, zone failing, ASG failing or are pretty defined, scoped problems. But services failing is a totally different can of worms. And why is that? Um, let me go back to the fundamentals of distributed systems. Distributed systems fail. They are inherently prone to failure. Some of the reasons why they fail are because of the complex interactions at scale. And uh, there are so many different services in a distributed system. And that, that creates a complexity in the whole system. There's variability across services. That same single service can be called by multiple other services in a service-oriented architecture. And the latency component is different. The response times may be different. For example, if there's service A that's been called by service B and C, the response time seen by B and C are, could be different. And that could cause failures. The distributed systems have Byzantine failures. Byzantine failures essentially could be of omission type, where your packet loss happens, the network fails, a router fails, you don't get an answer. Or it could be a commission failure where you know, our eventually consistent system gives different answers. So taking the same example, if service A is being called by B and C, depending on the time, 
you could have different answers from that same service if you're having an eventually consistent system. And the combinatorial complexity creates it very challenging in terms of availability. So if you're striving for four nines and you have a service-oriented architecture in a distributed systems, all the other services have to be better than four nines. Otherwise, you cannot achieve the four nines. The math just doesn't add up. Netflix has embraced microservices architecture. There's a talk today at 4.30 to, about this more in more detail. You can go listen to that. But this is a call graph of a single request that it enters the Netflix ecosystem from the ELB to our proxy layer. As you can see, the breadth and depth of this fan out is humongous. It pre pre presents an interesting challenges for us. What we've seen is any single service can cause cascading failures. I'll show you an example. A service or a cl cluster fails in its own right because of varied reasons. Somebody pushed in a bad code or the ASG crashed. But the, this affects the calling service. Now the callers of this service slow down. They cause failures because their threat pools start blocking. And pretty soon there is a cascading effect, a snowball effect. A small snowflake now becomes a big snowball and rushing at you at very high speeds. And before you know it, your whole entire system collapses like a big Jenga tower. And it's happened to us at Netflix. What did we do to prevent that? We created Hystrix, our fault tolerance system, our library, which has all the goodness of fallbacks, load shedding, bulk heading, and it prevents us from a single service taking out a whole system. But Hystrix also needs tuning and configuration. You need to tune the thread pools. You need to ensure that the fallbacks work. There's also a great talk today, again, at 3.30 about uh, massive uh, load at our edge and how we tackle that. You can get more in details in that. Um, before I go in here, let me tell you a quick story. Uh, we were running, trying to run Latency Monkey on a service, and I went to the service owner and I was talking about the Latency Monkey run to him and how, what the timing is. And there was another service owner with him. He was, as, was a batch application owner. And he asked the service owner, how does it affect my batch application? And the service owner goes, because it's latency monkey, your service will get latency problems. And the batch own application owner is like, no, 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 no. I'm a batch application owner guy. I don't care about latency. Don't do the latency monkey test. And there was a, a device UI guy working there too. His question was, how does the UI get affected if we do latency monkey test? And the service ha owner had no answer. And as Josh pointed out, there is a low adoption of latency monkey in Netflix. The reason was people are scared of running that in production because they didn't know what would happen and how their system affects any other system or the UI or the whole general ecosystem. So it was an aha moment for us. Uh, it was a big hammer, or I would say we were trying to slice an apple with a chainsaw. Don't try that at home, by the way. We needed a very precise way of injecting failures, request level simulations, and we created FIT. FIT is our request level precise failure injection system. Um, so this is a chart of this, how our architecture overall looks like and how the devices connect to the internet and how the system flows through. Let's say you were failing service A and B. A request from the ELB comes to Zool. Zool is our proxy layer. It introspects the request and sees if the device or account has been configured for failure. And this configuration is pushed to Zool in asynchronously. It's not a network call. Zool decorates that request with the failure context and passes it on to our edge layer. Then the edge layer makes a call to service B. And service B is failed because FIT has decorated the request 
and our fit library fails, injects failure. The failure could be uh, complete failure or latency. Now let's say Edge calls service A, and that has been configured to fail too, and that occurs. Second order effect that Josh mentioned earlier. It was hard to test that using latency monkey, but with fit, we enable that as well. So if service A then goes ahead and calls service B, that gets affected too. We wanted our uh, failures to be as close to and realistic as possible. So who injects those failures in our failure in the injection system? It's the failure injection points. Most of the services at Netflix are built using common building blocks. And those are the places where we inject failures. Some of the building blocks that we use is Ribbon, that's used for our IPC framework. As Tynix, our Cassandra client. Memcached client is EVCache. That is an injection point as well. Carion is a service container that all our services inherit. You can know more about these open source components at a 3.30 talk today about Netflix OSS, if you want to get some detailed view of those. And Hystrix, our fault tolerance system, is an injection point too. You may think, why is Hystrix, a fault tolerance system, an injection point injecting failures? The reason is we want to test that it's working and its fallbacks are working correctly. Uh, the bulk heading works correctly. Um, let me give you a little more detail about fit. As you saw, all these injection points are different. Some of them are IPC, some of them are persistence, caching. What fit provides is a common simulation syntax across all these different injection points. It provides a single simulation interface that all these libraries interface with. And if we create more of some similar injection points or building blocks, they will integrate with fit. And all this failure metadata and configuration is passed through HTTP request headers because we want it to be really fast. It's in memory lookup. I'll show you how we integrate this whole failure, how it flows through our SOA graph. This is an example of two services at Netflix. They are built using our open source building blocks. There is the filter, which is part of the Carion server container. Then you have your service application logic, and then ribbon to make IPC calls to other services. When a request comes into service A, it is already decorated by Zool with the failure injection metadata. Here's an example of that. It has a common namespace to define. Then you have a list of injection points that you need to affect. It has a concept of whitelist. The white, what the whitelist does is it defines whether these injection points should fail or not. I'll touch more upon that in a later slide. And we have an ID, a session associated with this failure injection session. Because one single user interaction could re result in multiple requests to our whole systems. And we need to tie all of that together. When this request is received by Carion, it looks at that uh, request header via fit, and then determines whether there should be a failure. And if so, failure occurs. If not, service A then calls service B. Before calling that too, we, ribbon integrates with fit. Again, this is an in-memory lookup call that tells it whether it needs to inject any failures. And if so, it injects. That helps us enable client-side failure injection. Then this request moves on to service B. Let's say we injected latency. After certain latency is injected, it moves to service B. There, from there on, it's rinse and repeat. The same thing happens again. And then the response is sent back. So as you can see, we've added failure injection through our entire call graph using fit and very, in a very precise manner. Uh, let me touch upon failure scenarios. Failure scenarios is a set of injection points that we want to fail. How do we define those failure scenarios? 
These can be defined based on past outages. If you have a, seen that a certain set of failures have caused outages, what we do is we create these failure scenarios and run through our system again to validate that we've become resilient and we've fixed those problems. Specific dependency interactions. What we do is, based on dependency interactions between multiple services, we define failure scenarios to inject failures. A white list of critical services. I'll touch more about critical service in my slides later on, but it essentially is a white list saying, don't affect these services, but I don't know about all the other services that are going to be interacting. Fail all of them. And that's the failure scenario you can define. FIT is not only used for injecting failures. What we use it is also for dynamic tracing of dependencies. As you saw in the previous call graph, it's a big fan out. And we want to trace the whole dependency tree. And we use FIT for that as well. Defining these scenarios and tracing these dependencies require insights. FIT insights are derived through SALP. Uh, SALP is a transparent sea creature. That's why we chose the name SALP, because it's transparency by design. It's a distributed tracing system we've created at Netflix, which has been inspired by the Dapper paper. It provides us insight into dependencies. The call graph, the service call graph that you see there, was all created using SALP. It, it helps us define and visualize those scenarios for failure. As much as we love our monkeys, we love our customers more. For us, every single stream is important. So we run our failures in production, but we do it carefully so that we don't affect our customer experience. And this is how we do it. We slowly dial up these failures. We first do functional validation using FIT. We have isolated synthetic transactions hitting our production systems through a well-known set of devices and causing failures for only those set of devices. That helps us functionally validate that our system is resilient. Then once we are comfortable that these failures won't affect customer experience, we start dialing up the chaos in our production environment by slowly lifting the gates of our Simeon army that's waiting there to come out and cause problems. We use traffic-based dialing. We uh, have a small percentage of our traffic injected to failure. And slowly and gradually, we dial up this knob while we are observing that there's no side effect on customer experience. And once it's comfortable, we are comfortable, we ratchet it up to 100%. We've built this tool for FIT. We've created the Simeon Army. But a great tool set is useless if you don't use it continuously. And we use it to, con to continuous validation. Uh, as you saw in the earlier diagram, there are so many services, microservices at Netflix. And the combinatorial like, complexity creates the challenge around availability. You cannot treat all these services equally. We've defined a set of services that are critical for our click and play scenario. Uh, social is a great example. Social provides very nice feature set from Netflix for you to share your information, viewing history, get recommendations from your friends, have social interaction. But it is not important for a click and play use case. So we considered that as a non-critical service. We've defined a set of critical services. We feed that in the fit scenario to make it whitelist and fail everything else. Then we have a set of devices that continuously run in production. We run it uh, at hourly on all the different device platforms we have. And these are continuously validating that none of the critical non-critical services becomes critical service. The reason is that if that happens, that whole uh, service Collapsing like a Jenga tower happens, and we don't want that to happen. So now, if you remember the story I told you about the latency monkey, where the user, uh, the service owners were very uh, hesitant to running it in production. Now, they don't have to. 
because we have created this ability to do functional testing first, then slowly dialing up our chaos. So now they don't have to fear these monkeys. Whenever we could schedule latency monkeys, they're like, yeah, bring it on. We are ready for it. What are the key takeaways from this talk today? You shouldn't wait for random failures because in a distributed system, in a cloud, random failures will occur. You should cause these failures to validate resiliency. That's really important. You should remove uncertainty by forcing failures regularly. Constantly ensure that your system is resilient to failures. Why? Because it's better to fail at 2 p.m. rather than 2 a.m. You don't want an outage at 2 a.m. where you're scrambling to wake up everybody and try to fix the problem. It's better to have people awake and ready when they're needed. And always test design assumptions by stressing them. Embrace failure. Failure will happen. So be prepared. A lot of our Simian Army apes are open sourced. Uh, a bunch of our building block systems are open sourced. You can leverage those. These are rest of the Netflix talks we have at reInvent going on. Very interesting talks about our open source technology. How do we maintain a resilient front door at massive scale? the microservices architecture, and so on. Thank you again for coming and listening to Josh and Naresh. Now we can open up for questions if you have any questions. Yes. Kind of define when you feel comfortable enough that your fault injection testing is never going to fail? Is that kind of the, the deciding factor of when you scale it up to 100% um, live traffic in production? Um, so I'll, I'll repeat the question. The question is, when we dial up our failure, uh, do we ensure that uh, these failures don't cause any problems completely? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, the no part is, the yes part is because of the critical services. We want to ensure our critical services are robust, so uh, we make sure that they are running fine. For the non-critical services, it's absolutely okay. We ratchet it up 100% because we know for sure this is not going to cause customer pain for the click and play scenario. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, so, so the question is, how does Chaos Gorilla work? Uh, is it done through uh, network tricks? No, it's not done through network tricks uh, because most of our services are deployed through our ASGs. Uh, what we usually do is, uh, and our ASGs are striped across three availability zones, we shrink our ASGs to two zones. And essentially, we have a script that goes in, takes one zone out, that's correct. We're just eliminating the services in that zone such that traffic has to go to the other two zones. And all the services that are not auto-scaled, we know, we have tagged them, and then we essentially kill the instances from there. Um, th that's a good question. The question is, uh, after we're done with the gorilla exercise where we take away a zone, and when we bring back a zone, that could cause a problems because of the replication delays and everything. Uh, yes, but we've create, architected a system such that um, most of our data is replicated, and even when the zone comes up, especially our Cassandra data store, we don't bring back those uh, nodes in service until they have failed. Filled up. Otherwise, there will be problems. Yes. I'd say, in general, also, anytime you're moving traffic, there's that same risk that things will not have spun up quickly enough. And so, that's something you just have to handle in a careful way and make sure you're not overwhelming your systems during this exercise. Yeah, so, so even after the, 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 the 
That's correct. That's correct. Uh, so you mentioned Cassandra is obviously a stateful system, um, so a bit of a different beast when you introduce chaos there. How do you handle that? I mean, I've had some bad experiences there, so I'm curious. Sure. Um, so uh, we have our Cassandra experts at our booth here. They can, they're better equipped to answer that question. Uh, but uh, for a chaos monkey exercise, we've hardened our Cassandra cluster through our Priam sidecar that it's op open source as well to withstand the monkey attacks. But uh, to be more, to give, if you want more detail, you can stop by our booth for so some of our CD folks out there. Um, there's a question at the back. So the fault injection tests are always running in the background. Uh, it's, they're running hourly on 11 different device platforms. And then there's, uh, we, we still are working on making that as a um, failure detection system where it'll get paged and things like that, but we, it's running all the time. So Naresh is talking specifically about FIT um, for Chaos Gorilla and Chaos Kong exercises. Those are definitely scheduled. Those are fairly large scale events. Chaos Monkey is running randomly throughout business hours uh, and has limits on how many instances it can take down, let's say, at a given time. Um, so some of them are scheduled, um, but the goal with FIT is for us to be continuously running that. And because it's synthetic transactions, there's very little risk in doing so or need to notify people that it's happening. Yeah. Uh, there were certainly a lot of conversations and a, and a need to better understand the resistance, and it took us a little while to figure that out. So, of course, we were a little bullheaded and kept going, well, we really should be doing this. Let's, let's push on this. Uh, and then as we really dug in and understood the function versus scale argument, we stepped back and we said, hey, you know what? Latency monkey is too much of a sledgehammer. Um, let's come up with something better, like fit, in order to build that confidence. Um, and so we fairly quickly figured that out and then shifted along those lines. Um, other exercises like, active, like our active-active failovers using Kong or Chaos Gorilla, um, those we feel like were as good as we were going to make them. And so uh, we were a little bit more um, adamant that we needed to do those exercises, even if people weren't necessarily comfortable with it. We did give people time to get ready, but we still scheduled those and, and uh, executed on those. So yeah. FIT, as, as it stands today, it uses, it, you need the Netflix building blocks, but it is, it is not open source yet, uh, but uh, we, it is pluggable, so we've created it to be as a pluggable module where you can plug in your own injection points. You don't have to use the Netflix injection points. You can plug in a, a relational database as an injection point or something like that. Um, all the way at the back. I think we need you to repeat the yes. question with the microphone. Uh, have you ever uh, encountered a part of your architecture that was uh, particularly difficult to simulate a failure or that you, you, you couldn't simulate a failure based on uh, some sort of uh, maybe a limitation of how the systems are, you know, chained or something like that? Um, so, uh, we essentially, when we architect our systems, we are the first goal for our, in our minds is things will fail. And they are bound to fail. And we've seen in our environment or in the cloud environment, things fail. And we make no assumptions around making it very uh, uh, tightly coupled. So uh, as, a, as a philosophy in our architecture, we assume that we will fail. And, and there are things like um, stateful services which we don't have many of those. Uh, most of our services are stateless, but the stateful services are the ones that 
we are a little more careful about. And there are previous outages that have, we've learned from and created failure scenarios around that. Does that answer your question? So that, that's, a, that's a good question. The question is, FIT has all these insights that it publishes. Does that add any extra toll to the request processing? Um, because it needs to persist data to Cassandra or not. Um, that was one of the biggest considerations we had while we were building SALT. And we modeled it after the Dapper paper. I would encourage you to read that paper. It's a really good paper. Uh, and this is not, the, our publishing is not done as part of request processing. Uh, it is done asynchronously, and it's pushed off uh, in a different manner. And we use a lot of uh, technologies for that. We use Elasticsearch. We have our own um, uh, Suro uh, system that publishes those data. So as, as a request processing piece, there is no tax. It's essentially free. Yes, so uh, the question is, uh, how do we uh, instrument other services that are not part of the building blocks? 90% of our services are built using our building blocks. I would say almost 100%. So we haven't had any others. Like we also, I didn't mention, uh, all of the AWS services are also injection points for us because we've written wrappers around it, like S3, SQS, uh, all those. And whenever we create new ones that make network calls, we integrate with FIT. And it's very simple. It's, it's, it has just asked the question, is there a failure? What is the failure? And I'll do the failure. This is probably a good time for us to break. Um, Naresh and I are going to be uh, downstairs at the Netflix booth. Um, if you guys want to come down and have one-on-one -on -one chats, we're happy to go into more detail on all this. And our Simeon Army posters are in our booth, too. So if you want a selfie with them, come down. <laughs>